Thank you. My talk is going to be quite brief. It's going to be basically autobiographical. And I hope that in the discussion period afterwards, um, you don't just treat me as an answer man, but an opportunity to think together about the issues. So can theological education be integrated? In 1989, the fall of 1989, I joined the Divin Yale Divinity School faculty after teaching philosophy for 30 years at Calvin College. I'd actually taught philosophy before that for two years at Yale in the philosophy department. My assignment at Yale Divinity School was to teach philosophy of religion. Though the um, boundaries at Yale between disciplines and departments <coughs> and schools are pretty porous, so I moved around. I taught aesthetics and uh, various other things. This was the first time that I'd had any official contact with a seminary or divinity school. Not only had I never previously taught in a seminary or divinity school, I'd never spent a second as a student in a seminary or divinity school. So I was functioning in, well, I, I say here in my notes, an unfamiliar environment. That's, that's not quite true. I mean, I'd spoken in seminaries and so forth over the years. But being, in, being a professor in a divinity school seminary was indeed an, an unfamiliar, unfamiliar environment for me, and it proved to be a learning experience in various ways. Not everything, as it turned out, however, not everything was unfamiliar. The curriculum of, I'm going to call it YDS from now on. The curriculum of YDS was, I haven't asked about your curriculum, was divided up into four areas, area one, two, three, and four. Areas one, two, and three contained biblical studies, um, systematic theology, philosophy of religion, history, so forth. Area four contained what were called practical studies, preaching, liturgy, church music, counseling, church education, that sort of thing. It took me no time at all to learn that there was a pecking order embedded in this curricular <coughs> arrangement. In area four, professors and students were said to apply what was taught and learned in the other areas. And it was just naturally assumed that applying biblical studies theology, philosophy of religion, and so forth, was an inferior enterprise to actually doing biblical studies and doing systematic theology and philosophy of religion and so forth. So, a pecking order. A pecking order of roughly that sort was familiar to me. It was familiar to me from Calvin College and from every other college or university with which I had ever had contact. Teaching students how to, I'm going to speak metaphorically, somewhat metaphorically, teaching students how to, here's the idea, teaching students how to use their hands is inferior to teaching students how to use their heads. Teaching musical performance is inferior to teaching musical theory. Teaching business is inferior to teaching economics. Teaching painting is inferior to teaching the history of painting and so forth. The former is a mere application of the latter, pecking order. And now, lo and behold, a pecking order with which the presence of a pecking order, hands versus head, metaphorically speaking, presence of that pecking order with which I was familiar in my college and every other college that I'd ever had contact with was replicated in YDS. Now let me here say that though my discipline, I'm a philosopher, that I'm in a discipline where we used our heads rather than our hands, I had always resented and resisted this pecking order. Um, insofar as I understand myself, one reason for that is that I was reared in a craft tradition. My father was a woodworker, my grandfather was a woodworker. So I'd always resented the put down of craft by artists and the put down of artists by art historians and music theorists and so forth. I had a second reason for resenting and opposing that sort of pecking order. 
it seemed to me to reflect the ancient Greek tradition in which the contemplative life is superior to the active life. The vita contemplativa is superior to the vita activa. Um, that had gone down into the West in the Middle Ages. The so-called liberal arts were superior to the so-called manual arts and so forth. It seemed to me that this was a replication of the um, basically Greek idea and that it had no way, uh, that, that it was indefensible within a Christian way of looking at things. Um, so I opposed it both so for these personal reasons. I resented the sort of personal put down implicit in it and for theological, philosophical reasons. Um, I came to love a sentence from one of the um, uh, English Puritans, Joseph Hall. Um, I'll give it to you and then I suppose I have to explain it. Here's Hall's little applicant. God loveth adverbs. Here's the idea. Verbs. God doesn't much care what you do, provided it's a responsible occupation and so forth. What God cares is how you do it. So sweeping floors is just as noble as doing philosophy, but it depends on how you do it. So God loveth adverbs. Um, not only did I find that my YDS colleagues in areas one, two, and three, and I was in one of those areas, um, that my YDS colleagues in those areas were looking down on our colleagues in area four because they, as it were, used their hands. I discovered that everybody, th everybody thought that what was uh, taught in area four was more or less a grab bag of things with no discernible structure. So then a senior colleague in area four retired and the faculty of YDS decided that this was a good time to, an opportune time to try to introduce some structure into Area 4. Um, they didn't seem to be worried about the pecking order thing, just to introduce some structure into this grab bag of liturgy, uh, church music, um, preaching, uh, church education, and so forth. Committee was appointed, and I was asked to be on the committee. I was quite reluctant, um, didn't know that I had anything to contribute, um, but I agreed to serve. And for the first several meetings, I just basically listened. I think my only responses was when I didn't understand what somebody said, I said, you've got to explain that to me. I, uh, no, I don't understand that. Now around the same time, I had read, for reasons that I do not remember, a book by Jean Leclerc, a Belgian monk, Jean Leclerc, titled The Love of Learning and the Desire for God. I think it's a marvelous book. It was, for me, an eye-opener. In the book, Leclerc discusses theology as it was practiced in the medieval monasteries. And he argued that monastic theology was explicitly aimed at formation of the monastic community. Now I'd read a good deal of medieval theology and philosophy, but all the medieval philosophy and theology that I had read was school theology and philosophy, or if it was not actually school theology and philosophy, it was taught to me as if it were school, scholastic um, theology and philosophy. I knew of no other tradition. Nobody had ever mentioned it to me. But now here I come in contact with a whole alternative tradition to what was going on in the medieval schools, what was going in, on in the medieval monasteries. Let's call it, well, school theology is typically called scholastic theology, philosophy. Let's call this alternative formation theology, okay? Because that's what it was aimed at. It was aimed at formation. Um, Bernard preached, as I recall, 86 sermons on the Song of Songs to his fellow monks, and he was only halfway through the book. Um, so that it was aimed at formation. Now another thing that comes in. Quite some time earlier, before I had read um, Leclerc, I had read Gustavo, Gu Gustavo Gutierrez's A Theology of Liberation. Gutierrez is a South American liberation theologian, theology of liberation. 
And then I learned that one of my Yale colleagues was teaching Gutierrez in her systematic theology course, and that she had divided up what, Gutier what Gutierrez had to say about liberation, that she had divided up Gutierrez into the standard um, theological loci of theology, anthropology, Christology, and so forth. And frankly, that just seemed to me an utterly bizarre way of teaching Gutierrez. How many of you have read Gutierrez's Theology of Liberation? Anybody? Doesn't this strike you offhand as, I mean, this is fitting square pegs into round holes. Uh, just seemed to me bizarre. But I didn't press her on it. it no, it didn't seem right for me to press her on it. But now things began to come together. Gutierrez is also not a school theologian. He's never taught in a university. What is he? He's a formation theologian. In his case, the community that he aims to form happens not to be a monastery, but happens to be a community of poor people in Lima, Peru, and then counterpart communities in other places. So what, Gut so what Gutierrez is doing is structurally similar to what Bernard was doing, formation theology. Thirdly, one of the South African theologians, a good friend of mine, Alan Busak, is also not a school, is a theologian, but not a school the theologian. He too, if you have to classify it, is a formation theologian concerned to form community of his fellow people of color, especially in South Africa. And now the floodgates were opened. How about John Calvin? Calvin is typically taught nowadays by systematic theologians. But if you've read the Institutes, suppose first you read Thomas Aquinas, classic school theology, okay? And then you read Calvin's Institutes, it feels like a different world. Um, two years ago, I was, at, I was at the University of Virginia, and a group of us were there and decided to read through the entire Institutes across the year. I'd never done that, and nobody else in the group had done that either. One of the people was a good friend of mine from the philosophy department. I can give you his name, Trenton Merricks. And Trenton was deeply disappointed by the Institutes. It was not at all what he had anticipated. He thought it would be a Protestant equivalent to Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, and it was just, it was a different genre, and he didn't know what to do with it. So what was Calvin up to? Calvin was, wanted to form his community, uh, teach them how to read scripture, um, is what he says his purpose is, so as to, so as to cultivate piety. Pietas. Um, pietas has a somewhat broader meaning than the word piety in contemporary English, but that was, that's his goal. So his goal is not to teach systematic theology, but community formation. So um, these thoughts led to the following idea. It turns out that there's a long tradition of what you might call, or what I've been calling, formation theology. It goes back into the church fathers, the medieval monasteries, the Reformation cities, Lima, Peru, Cape Town, South Africa, and so forth. So, here's the thought that came to mind. How about introducing, how about taking as the basic context for Area 4, formation theology? Not systematic theology, which we then think of as applying an area for, but how about putting together a, an anthology of formation theology, and then introducing students, as, as the beginning of area four, introducing students to this alternative theological tradition. Um, and then, once one has introduced them to it, mine the tradition for whatever seems relevant and appropriate for the people in front of us, the students, forming whatever communities they are going to go out to be responsible for forming. And then not just mind the tradition, but think for ourselves about in the tradition of formation theology um, for the 21st century for pastors in North America, pastors in Africa, and so forth. Um, I thought it would be fascinating to put together a, such an anthology of formation theology. I'm not aware that anybody's ever done it. So I worked up my proposal with some care, 
and presented it to the committee. Somewhere along the line, I lost my paper copy and it got deleted from my computer. So um, I no longer know the details of what I said. But I worked it out along the lines that I've suggested. I thought this would be really interesting. It fell like a lead balloon. <laughs> Nobody asked any questions about what I proposed. Nobody argued against what I proposed. Nobody said that they found it interesting or worth thinking about. Nobody said anything. Nobody said anything at the time. And nobody said anything later. <laughs> the chairman declared that it was getting late, <laughs> that we still had some business that we had to get done before we adjourned. And so let's move on to that. I have no idea what my Yale colleagues thought of it. Clearly, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I do, of course. Clearly, it, didn't, it did not grip their imagination. That, that was perfectly clear. But why it didn't, I have no idea. I still like the idea, and I would like to see it tried somewhere. It might be that insuperable difficulties would turn up, but I think it bears the promise of doing two things. First, it bears the promise of getting rid of this pecking order. In Area 4, you don't just apply systematic theology, but there's an alternative theology of formation theology, which has its own tradition and importance and significance and so forth. That for one thing. And second, it would integrate the disciplines in Area 4. All of them would be seen as working at some side of formation of a parish of, or whatever it is that one's students go to work in. Um, well, that's it. To this day, I have no idea why my Yale colleagues found it so boring or repulsive. I don't even know which of those <laughs> words applies. <laughs> That's it. What do you think? <laughs> oh, dead silence. 